atrium for this new managing director. I'm going to keep my comments here extremely short as I speak to an audience that is exceptionally informed. Um, simply to say the challenges forward into this annual meeting change by the day. John Farrell and I saw that this morning. Change by the moment. It makes the three documents of this body, I call them the blue book, the brown book, the green book. I know you change the colors. But it makes these documents critically important for our understanding forward. But most importantly, in this historic moment, we need a message and the consistent message of this new managing director. Ladies and gentlemen, the 12th managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Tom, for, for this uh, very appropriate, sober, succinct, focused introduction. Uh, it is a great honor to be in this auditorium to deliver my first speech as the Managing Director of the IMF. It is a tradition that my wonderful predecessor, Christine Lagarde, lifted up and passed to me, and I would do my best to follow into it, discussing the outlook and priorities ahead of our annual meetings. As many of you know, Christine was a member of the French National Synchronized swimming team. So I want to honor her today by borrowing the word synchronized for my speech, and you would see, soon see why. Um, when I took over as a managing director, I thought about what the ministers and the governors might ask the IMF when we gather here for the annual meetings next week. Uh, I talked to David Lipton, um, who has so ably led the fund in this interim period, and I spoke to many of my new colleagues. One question that stood out to all of us was, what can we all do to help fix the fractures in the global economy and encourage stronger growth. I am very uh, grateful that I am not wrestling with this question alone. I have the support of this great institution, our excellent executive board, and the premier staff that has done great research that underpins my speech. So let's get to it. Two years ago, the global economy was in synchronized upswing. Measured by GDP, nearly 75% of the world was accelerating. Today, even more of the world economy is moving in sync. But, unfortunately, this time growth is decelerating. To be precise, in 2019, we expect slower growth in nearly 90% of the world. In other words, the world economy is now in synchronized slowdown. And this wi widespread deceleration means that growth this year will fall to its lowest rate since the beginning of the decade. Next week, we are going to release the World Economic Outlook. It will show revised downward projections for both 2019 
and for 2020. The headlight numbers reflect a rather complex situation. Despite this overall deceleration, close to 40 emerging market and developing economies are forecast to have real GDP growth rates above 5%, including 19 economies in sub-Saharan Africa. In the United States and Germany, unemployment is at historic lows. And yet, across advanced economies, including in the US, Japan, and especially in the Eurozone, there is a softening of economic activity. In some of the largest emerging market economies, such as India and Brazil, the slowdown is even more pronounced this year. And in China, as we all know, growth is gradually coming down from the rapid pace it saw in many years. This precarious outlook presents challenges everywhere, but especially for countries already facing difficulties, including some of the funds program countries. So why the slowdown in 2019? There is a range of issues and one common theme across these issues, fractures. I will start with trade. We have spoken in the past about the dangers of trade disputes. Now we see that they are actually taking a toll. Global trade growth has come to almost standstill, in part because of trade tensions, worldwide manufacturing activity and investment have weakened substantially. There is a serious risk that services and consumption could also soon be affected. And the fractures are spreading. Disputes now extend between multiple countries and into other critical issues. Currencies are once again in the spotlight. Because of our interconnected economies, many more countries will soon feel the impact. Uncertainty driven by trade, but also by Brexit and geopolitical tensions is holding back economic potential. And even if growth picks up in 2020, the current rifts could lead to changes that last for a generation. Broken supply chains, siloed trade sectors, <coughs> a digital Berlin Wall that forces countries to choose between technological systems. <clears throat> and our goal has to be to fix these fractures. Our world is intertwined, so our responses must be coordinated. And I believe we can do it. Starting from unleashing the growth generating capacity of trade. I said trade tensions are taking a toll. And now, especially with the privilege of this new screen we have, I can show you what I mean. So you will see a graphic that is part of the updated analysis on, tariff, on tariffs that we will release next week. It shows the projected global GDP loss from the escalating trade conflict between the US and China. The blue, the yellow, and the purple blocks show the direct costs on businesses and consumers from the three rounds of implemented and announced tariffs. And now look at the red blocks. This is what happens when the expected secondary impacts are added, and they include loss of confidence, market reactions, and loss of productivity. The, the results on this screen, very clear. Everyone loses in a trade war. 
for the global economy, the cumulative losses of trade conflicts could get us to about $700 billion by 2020. This is around 0.8% of global GDP. Not something to sniff at. Anybody from Switzerland here? Any Swiss? Well, maybe it's right that there is nobody for Switzerland because in this scenario, the whole economy of Switzerland disappears. <clears throat> so what we need to do is roll our sleeves, work together now, and find lasting solution on trade. This requires difficult decisions. This requires political will. But it is worth it. Trade is good for growth, it is good for jobs, it is good for poverty reduction. And we need to embrace the complexity of change to lift it up. Countries need to address legitimate concerns related to their trade practices. That means dealing with subsidies as well as intellectual property rights and technology transfers. We also need a more modern global trading system, particularly to unlock the full potential of services and e-commerce. We have to get in every country a strong commitment to zero on communities that are negatively impacted by technology and by trade. In other words, the key is to improve the system, not to abandon it. Let me move to other policy areas that are essential to encourage higher growth and create more opportunity. When it comes to improving people's lives, the hard work starts where? It starts at home. I learned this lesson firsthand. Growing up behind the Iron Curtain, I saw, I felt the high costs of bad policies. And I also saw how a shift to good policies with international support can help put the country and its people back on the path to prosperity. So let me focus on domestic policy priorities we believe are critical to accelerate growth and build more resilient economies. And then I want to turn to how a renewed commitment to international cooperation and synchronized policy action can help us more fully address these fractures. Let me begin with monetary policy and financial stability. Central banks around the world are striving to fulfill their mandates under difficult circumstances. Their independence is the foundation of sound monetary policy. How can they best fulfill their mandates? They should communicate their plans clearly, remain data dependent, evidence driven, and where appropriate, keep interest rates low, especially since inflation is still subdued in many countries and and overall growth is weakening. However, interest rates are already very low and even negative in many advanced economies. So in these places, there may be limited space to do more with conventional tools. Prolonged low rates also come up with negative side effects and unintended consequences. Think of pension funds and life insurance companies that are taking on more risky investments to meet their return objectives. In our surveillance, we see such an increase in risk-taking by investors broadly all over around the world. And all of this creates financial vulnerabilities. In some countries, firms are using low rates and building up debt to do what? To fund mergers, mergers and acquisitions instead of investing. Our new analysis, and, and, I, and I do want to stress uh, this is actually quite, quite important to pay attention to, it shows that if a major downturn occurs, 
corporate debt at risk of default would rise to $19 trillion, or nearly 40% of total debt in eight major economies. This still has low probability, but is above the level seen during the financial crisis. Low interest rates are also prompting investors to search for higher yield in emerging markets. This leaves many small economies, and I hear this at, at our board by those who represent small economies, that they are exposed to a sudden reversal of capital flows. They worry about this risk. So we need macroprudential tools, and we can use new approaches to better manage that, reduce financial booms and busts, and contain volatility. And there is something that we need to stress very clearly. The staff of the fund has been doing that relentlessly. Monetary and financial policies cannot do the job alone. Fiscal policy must play a central role. When I crossed the street from the World Bank to the IMF, I learned something very interesting, that I didn't quite know what IMF stands for. Apparently, IMF stands for it's mostly fiscal. So let me be true to form and focus on fiscal policy next. Now is the time for countries with room in their budgets to deploy or get ready to deploy fiscal firepower. In fact, low interest rates may give some policymakers additional money to spend in places such as Germany, the Netherlands, South Korea. There is space for increase in spending. Some countries are already zeroing on that. I'm looking at our Dutch colleague on the board. And it is especially good to invest in infrastructure, human capital, and R&D. That would boost demand, but in addition, it would boost growth potential medium long term. Now, this advice is not going to work everywhere because globally public debt has ballooned. Uh, it stands at over $190 trillion, or 226% of global GDP. So countries that have high debt to GDP ratio, they still need to hold on fiscal restraint. It continues to be warranted. Uh, countries will, of course, tailor policies to what works for them. But in every country, reducing debt and deficits should always be done in a way that protects education, health, and jobs. Uh, and this is a lesson the fund has learned and is applying in all countries we engage uh, with. And every country needs to wrestle with the question of where in a rapidly changing world new sources of growth will come from. And I believe that focusing on fundamentals will help answering this question. One way that um, is so obvious to create more public space is through domestic review mobilization, a theme very dear to the heart of many finance ministers around the world. How can we do that? Obviously, reducing corruption, utilizing digital, digital tools in tax collection, it can unlock resources and fuel new investments in people. And it can help countries meet the sustainable development goals. And as countries decide which policy is most appropriate, all of us, we have to keep an eye on the uh, medium long-term horizon. We need to be mindful that automation and shifting demographics create very different conditions in countries. They pressure all to zero on the structure of their economies. And if they don't act, what is the outcome? Most likely, countries will be stuck in mediocre growth. Uh, the IMF did a very interesting new research focused specifically on emerging market and developing, developing economies. And this research is about structural reforms and how they can raise productivity and generate enormous economic gains. What the research shows is that the, the right reforms in the right sequence 
could boost growth by about a percentage point and double the speed at which emerging markets and developing economies reach the living standards of advanced economies. What is not to like? We also know that when countries undertake reforms, at the same time, in other words, when there is coordinated push for reforms, we can generate positive spillover effect. So what works best? Um, I, I, wa I want to give you a couple of examples to make this high road discussion on structural reforms more real. Take Chile, child care programs. What did they do? Lifted up female labor market uh, uh, participation and it helped the economy. And it proved beyond any doubt something that Christine would like to stress always, that empowering women is an economic game changer. In Ghana, anti-corruption legislation created more transparency and accountability. In Jamaica, a country that is now completing a uh, fund-supported program, cutting red tape made it easier to start a new business, especially for small businesses. In Egypt, another country that completed a fund program, phasing out energy subsidies made the sector attractive to private finance. Some 14 to 16 billion dollars were invested and that created more space for public financing of education and other social expenditures. These are the types of reforms, as hard as they may be, are critical for a better uh, future and also to be ready for shocks should they occur. I want to pause here and acknowledge uh, somebody who worked here at the fund and we would host a conference in her honor, Yang Ho. She studied many of these issues and sadly passed away last year. And uh, in, in, in her honor, I want to uh, borrow a proverb from her home country, from Vietnam, and it says, the time to jump is before your feet get wet. So we better jump. If we wait for the next crisis, it's going to be late. We need to act now, and we also need to act together. And here is what I see. While the need for international cooperation is going up, the will to engage is going down. Trade is a clear case in point. And yet, we need to work together. From safely adapting to fintech to fully implementing the financial regulatory reform agenda to fighting money laundering and the financing of terrorism. And we need to work together to address climate change. It is a crisis where no one is immune and everyone has a responsibility to act. Just a small anecdote, we were discussing climate change yesterday with a team of colleagues and I was asking them, do we have in the uh, IMF a way to offset our own carbon footprint? We offset our travel, but we don't yet quite have a way for individuals to walk their conviction. And so here is my promise to you, we will have it. And I do hope people would enroll. We are in the IMF committed to assist countries to reduce carbon emissions and become more climate resilient. And we recognize that at the current average carbon price of $2 per ton, most people and most companies have very little financial incentive to make this transition. Well, I need to, uh, to acknowledge that um, behind this average of $2, there are countries that are pricing carbon at a very high level, 
and countries that are not pricing it at all, which reminds me, my professor of statistics uh, loved to say about averages, you put your head in the refrigerator, you put your feet in the oven, your temperature is average, but you're dead. <laughs> so we have to work, we have to work to move to the higher end on carbon uh, pricing. Uh, and uh, we, in uh, our recent work in the fiscal monitor, uh, came up with some very interesting analysis around uh, the deployment of carbon tax. Some countries have already embraced that straightforward strategy. Uh, a very good example is Sweden. Anybody from Sweden? Or the rule of today is a country I mentioned has no national of that country in the audience. Okay. So we, here is what Sweden has done. They introduced a carbon tax in 91. Low and middle income households received higher transfers and tax cuts to help offset higher energy costs. That policy shift the tax system of uh, Sweden, but it was also incredibly instrumental to reduce Sweden's carbon emissions by 25% at the time its economy has increased by 75%. Quite remarkable. We in uh, the fiscal monitor stress that point that a powerful and efficient tool is in fiscal. But we also make a very important point that key is to change the tax system, not to add an additional tax that can be perceived as burden. Additional revenues could be used to cut taxes elsewhere and fund assistance to millions of affected households. And these new resources can also boost investments in clean energy infrastructure. And I want to, to make it very clear, this is concentrated on mitigation. We also do a lot of work on adaptation to climate change. We believe that there is a tremendous growth potential in assisting countries to adapt low carbon climate resilient growth. In the uh, monitor, we also show that uh, green bonds that used to be exotics are picking up, they're becoming a mainstream uh, instrument. This is a great development, not good enough. We have to very seriously embrace across the board action and we must cooperate. We must work together in a way that generates renewed confidence in multilateralism. Making the case for cooperation to a more skeptical world requires delivering real result, results in people's lives. Only when people see they're better off because we work together, they believe in the value of us working together. So let me conclude in the following way. If the global economy show, slows more sharply than expected, if that happens, we may need a coordinated fiscal response. And let me be, be very clear, we are not there, but when it comes to preparing for the possibility of a coordinated response, there is a great phrase from Shakespeare, better three hours too soon than a minute too late. And we actually do need to prepare thoroughly should that risk is stronger on the, on the horizon. So to put it in, uh, in the way appropriate for the uh, key word of my speech, if the synchronized slowdown worsens, we may need a synchronized policy response. We have seen how effective that approach can be. We have seen it uh, in uh, 2009 and the G20 commitment to a joint stimulus. And it is an important reminder to all of us, countries have to protect their citizens, leveraging international cooperation for mutual benefit. Let me, let me finish where I started. Close your eyes and imagine synchronized swimming.
and then think of the next week when 189 member countries will gather together in Washington. I would urge them to come prepared to find solutions, to join their forces for the bigger public good. We have to be clear, the world economy is still growing, but it is just growing too slowly. To reverse this trend, to meet the aspirations of people, we cannot afford to be complacent. We must act. And I'm confident that if we cooperate, mindful of each other's challenges and different interests, we can deliver a better future for all. Yes, we can. Thank you. Is this show in Washington Nationals? Not yet. No. <laughs> <clears throat> Wonderful. Wonderful. I just, I just figured it out. This was Washington Nationals over the last few days, I presume. Uh, this is far too limited a time, so I'm not going to joke around. I'm just going to get right to it. This, this annual meeting will be extraordinary. You certainly heard the urgency there. The command of the managing director. I, I, I want to go to the phrase that was within your speech of a digital Berlin Wall. There are those of us that each in our own way of a certain vintage experienced from a distance, 1989, 1990. You lived it. The distinctive feature here of this moment uh, at your tenure at the World Bank and then here now is you lived it, particularly for the younger people in the room. Explain one moment of November of 1989 to those first elections in June of 1990 in your Bulgaria. Well, the uh, most uh, dramatic memory that uh, I have is how sudden change was. For so long, we have been living in these two separate worlds and have gotten accustomed to the thought that we were born on the other side of the Iron Curtain and we would die on the other side of the Iron Curtain. But what was so clear was that people can only tolerate that much of lack of rights, freedom of speech, lack of information. To me, when it happened, obviously I celebrated with all Bulgarians, but I celebrated more than anything else the right to know, the access to information. Mm -hmm. And I can tell people in this room that we, of course, yes, it, was, it is now great. We have a market economy. Uh, in the world I grew up, we all had exactly the same clothes. You go to, to school, we are all dressed the same way. We had the same bags. Market did not exist. We would sign to buy a car. And lucky 15 years later, guess what? You have a car. But that was not the biggest achievement of bringing the wall down. The biggest was freedom. The freedom to say what you think, the freedom to move where you want to go, and the freedom to be who you are. My biggest lesson from this experience, very simple, change is unstoppable. Within the change that's unstoppable is the trade revolution that we've seen. Douglas Irwin up at Dartmouth, of course, encyclopedic on this, fine. But in the modern age, the IMF is represented from the Atlantic Charter to 1944 and on. All of these shades of a multilateral world, how at risk right now is the multilateral success of the last half century? 
Well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm actually a bit more cautiously optimistic about the uh, role of multilateralism because uh, despite the nationalistic tendencies, every day we see and we feel how interdependent we are. Uh, the irony of this last year is that while countries may have been more interested in nationalist policies, we still have the world more in sync than it was two years ago. Mm -hmm. And I also know that this intertwined world is irreversible. So what we have to do is be humble and, and candid with ourselves, admit mm -hmm. that for far too long, we have been ignoring the fact that globalization is better for the educated, urban, younger people, younger generation, and it is harder on the rural, less educated, older generations. And we have taken it for granted that because they are still better off, they would embrace it, not not recognizing their fears. So to, to my mind, all is in our hands to repair the confidence in multilateralism, to repair. For that, we have to be grounded and understand what drives people to push back. How can the IMF assist those that are not advantaged by globalization, advantaged by technology? How can the IMF project a policy that will lift them up and protect them from this modern neo-mercantilism we see? Well, first and foremost, by recognizing that uh, inequalities are a drug on multilateralism and they are a drug actually on growth by recognizing that we have a huge responsibility to always think of the positive in policy change, but also on who is going to, to lose uh, from it. And what can we do? Uh, now, the, in, in, in the last years, the IMF has done something that, uh, that I admire, and I would drive that in, in practical mm -hmm. implementation, which is a very different approach to social policies, recognition that vulnerable people, we need to know who are the vulnerable to be impacted by policies, and we need to know how to protect them. Uh, for example, I'm thinking of Egypt, when Egypt adopted a very dramatic phasing out of energy subsidies, there was special attention on the poor people for whom that was really devastating, and a program, Egyptian program, to help these people weather that change. Right. We have to have the empathy for the vulnerable, the poor, those that are falling behind. As institution, what I can, I, what I can promise you is that in everything we do, I do, that is what I would be zeroing on. Because if we are to be only thinking of growth, and not the consequences for those who fall behind. We built the erosion of trust in national authorities, in multilateral organization. We harm that very growth we want to support. Uh, John Lipsky in the audience today, and of course, uh, Dr. Lipsky, very involved in 06, 07, 08. And one of the phrases that I heard him speak of often was this more modern concept of a macroprudential risk. And we've moved on from that. I think we're, we're, we've moved a little bit away from those more overt financial risks. What's the risk into these annual meetings? What's the global risk that sums up where we are right now? Well, is it the, trust? The, the, of, of course, there is a big issue of trust. Uh, uh, there is also in my view, a, a risk of complacency. We are decelerating, we are not stopping. And it's not that 
bad. And yet, unless we act now, Mm -hmm. We are risking a potential, uh, potential s m more massive slowdown. Uh, I think you, you brought the, uh, the issue of trust. Um, it is absolutely fundamental for trust to always think not only what is good f for me, but what is that you face? What is your domestic constraint? What are the challenges for you? and how we can craft space for decision-making that allows the whole to be bigger than the sum of individual parts. And it requires, frankly, if I can be very, very honest in this audience, it requires more women at the table. Mm -hmm. I, I look at... Uh I look at this issue of trade now, and from where I sit in the, in the privileged position I sit in, of all this news flow coming in, it is tit for tat, mm -hmm. not only with the obvious statement and to mention two nations, the United States of America and, and China, but as you mentioned, Switzerland, it redounds across everyone right now, this trade war. How will you define the trade war at these meetings, and what's your to-do list to remove us from this tit for tat. So we are going to get in the meetings, we are going to be showing this graph, uh, uh, and we are going to be saying, we are going to be talking about trade peace, not about trade war. Oh, I like that. I, I have not heard that phrase before. Who invented that in the room? Did you, did you, very good, trade peace, okay. And we would do it because uh, what is so very obvious of the graph, and actually, if I can have it back on the screen, well, I'm glad you asked for that, because I want to go to that next, please. Okay, good. Back on the screen, if, I, if we may. Okay. What is so obvious? That is so gloomy, just like the IMF. <laughs> Who says the IMF is gloomy? Oh, what I... I are, <laughs> what we are is um, uh, we, are being, we are being instituted uh, to help the world has, have more stability. And uh, to have more stability, part of our job is to say, look, be, be careful, you may be stepping in a hole. But looking at this graph, what is so very obvious is that it is the indirect impacts that really bite. Loss of confidence. That's right where I wanted to go. Loss of productivity, market <clears throat> impacts, because firms have to, to pay more for credits because they're trading with a partner that may be in, in worse shape. So the indirect is what we need to zero on. Why? Because we know that confidence once undermined is harder to rebuild. Right. And we also know from many, many, many decades of experience that the mother of all crises Crisis of well, you mentioned confidence. That's right where I wanted to go. David Lipton in your latest September magazine mentions governance. Mm -hmm. Governance is about leadership. What is your leadership approach that will begin to instill the confidence necessary to get towards your piece of trade? Well, the, uh, what we do is to show as clearly as possible that everybody is a loser in a trade war. Therefore, everybody would be a winner in trade peace. And make it clear that that loss may be higher on some countries and lower on others, but everybody is impacted. And then concentrate on rational behavior. Now, I must admit that we as an institution are in the position, if I am to use, I, I see the Bulgarian ambassador, I'm going to use a Bulgarian proverb, we are in a position that we can take a horse to water by showing the evidence, peace is better than war, but we cannot make the horse drink. That has to go into national self-interest and decision-making 
that is being also informed by the views of the public. So the broader this information is, and this is why we are grateful to, to you for allowing us to show, we are already shooting ourselves in the foot. The more we can show it to ordinary citizens, we hope the more there would be that self-interest of saying, oh, come on, peace is better than war. To the fiscal book, and an honor to speak with uh, Dr. Gaspar earlier this morning, what is so important within the fiscal impasse is how we spend the money. And I would respectfully suggest that the United States, just as one nation, there's many other nations like this, that has a reticence of debt and deficit, even with our trillion dollar deficits as reported, is we're not quite sure how the money's gonna get spent. If we find our fiscal space, what is the best use of that growing debt and deficit? Look, I, I, am, uh, I am very uh, biased on this topic. I think we need to recognize the speed of change and that our duty in public spending is to prepare nations to be better positioned in that fast-changing world. Mm -hmm. And that means investing in, uh, in uh, digital infrastructure, infrastructure overall, but especially digital infrastructure, investing in human capital, education, health, social protection, making sure that you actually have the skills of tomorrow, not of yesterday, mm -hmm. and investing in research and development. These are investments that are, for every nation on this planet today, hugely important. I lift up invest investing in people as one investment that, that has been somewhat um, ignored. Traditionally, there would be this notion that you invest in yourself because you benefit from that. It is your salary that goes up. And yet, I think it is becoming, people are becoming such an incredible adjustment and competitiveness factor that it is, it is more than ever a public good for the country. So you want to be rich tomorrow? Invest in your people today. What form of capitalism then do you see as a more modern capitalism? If we are locking in every man for themselves, every woman for themselves, and you're looking at a broad public good, that's the edge of the modern debate, isn't it? Yeah. So how do we move forward to a Georgieva capitalism? <laughs> you know, what I like about capitalism is competition and rights. That absolutely must stay. Competition makes us all do better, right? What I don't like is when we then go to the extreme and say, every man, every woman on their, entirely on their own. So finding that right space when we look at the interests of the collective, mm -hmm. and that is the platform on which we build our policies, and yet we demand from the individual, so perhaps this is the formula Georgieva capitalism is, uh, interests of the collective, demand responsibility and accountability of the indiv individual, working that, in that mm -hmm. uh, harmony. Uh, mm -hmm. I would never want to go back to the days uh, of, oh, we are all equal. Not only because we were all equal, but some were more equal than others. <laughs> I don't want to go there because when you pull the plug of competition, it's right. mediocrity that takes over and we're all worse off. But I also don't want to be in a world where we don't care about prosperity for all and we don't build that cohesion that makes society vibrant and performing. Right. Um, how many of you would like to live in Georgieva capitalism with collective responsibility for all of us and demand from the individual? Anybody willing? So we're not quite there. I need to, I need to work on the details. 
Uh, let me see those. Okay. Let me see show of hands of those that have not signed uh, in yet. I want to bring you in a task force so we can pull it together. And next time we would have a. a um, um, it's a to-do list for after lunch. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking over there at your fancy logo with a hundred a zillion flags on it. I want to spend the last number of minutes. I know you have to solve Brexit at 11 a.m. So let's move on to emerging markets. You cut your yep. teeth, not only LSE, uh, MIT, but also uh, at the, what's the, what's the building across the street? You cut your teeth on Is emerging. Yeah, the, you cut your teeth on emerging markets. Let us talk about the impoverished right now mm. and how we, we, we forget in our day-to-day -day race of developed excellence about those truly struggling. Identify your view on how we approach those most challenged. Thank you for asking this question. What we need to recognize is that a combination of four factors, and they come in different, uh, different weight um, conflicts, natural disasters, very high population growth, unsustainably high population growth, and bad governance. We have a number of countries and people in these countries that struggle virtually to survive. And we owe them our full commitment and attention. At the fund, there is now full recognition that fragile, conflict-affected states, they ought to be not only front and center in, in the work of the fund, but we have to have tailor-made policies for them, mm -hmm. different from what we do in middle-income countries and even in stable, low income What is the countries? distinction between what the World Bank will do for those troubled nations, challenged nations, and what you will do at the International Monetary Fund? My, 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 my uh, determination is that the bank and the fund and others work together. Mm -hmm. I think the challenge is so big and it is so hard that no institution on its own can succeed, but together we can make a difference in the lives of these people. What is for the fund? Obviously, the fund has to play on its strength. And the strength of the fund is in monetary, fiscal, structural policies. Bringing that understanding in situations of fragility and then working with the, with the bank and actually working with humanitarian agencies that are grounded in these countries gives us a much better chance to turn the fate, fate of people mm. around. Uh, I, am, uh, I actually would say that uh, some of these countries, it just breaks your heart to see people suffering because they have no reason to be poor. Zimbabwe has no reason to be poor if there is good governance. It is endowed country that has so, it is so naturally rich. Uh, or, or you take uh, a country like Central African Republic or DRC. So, Unless we turn around how these countries are governed, mm -hmm. we are not going to get to a sustainable uh, uh, chance. And there are these other countries that, that are actually deprived of resources and are hammered by climate change. And there we have to work on finding solutions, building resilience for communities, and it is possible. Mm -hmm. But it takes long-term approach, one thing the fund cannot do in these countries, go in one-year program. What can you do in one year? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Longevity and partnerships, and then being absolutely persistent in the will to work with those who want to see change. One final question, Dr. Gurgiev, if I, if I could, and this goes to the arch task of the International Monetary Fund, which is to provide relief under financial crisis, to provide relief in a time of banking, fiscal debt instabilities as well. How will you bring that arch mandate forward? Well, this is where uh, the fund is really quite unique. Uh, 
it comes in the most desperate situations, takes quite some, some risk sometimes, mm -hmm. and then is able to work with countries to get to that turnaround moment. My country was one of them. And of course it is tough and it is harsh on people, but we always have to think what it would be if the fund is not there. What would be the devastation of a completely ruined economy with no hope to rebuild? Uh, what I would like us to do in our work with, uh, with countries in, in programs is to be what Christine defined in her exit from here, a wallet, a brain, but more than anything else, a beating heart. I think we'll leave it right there. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.